Und dear, dear Diogo, dear Philippe, thank you very much for the kind words and the nice introduction. And um, I also would like to extend a warm welcome to everyone that is participating today in this digital conference. I hope you're well and that you also will enjoy some of the insights that we put together and that we would like to share with you on innovation during times of COVID-19. So before we start, maybe um, if a little word on like, how am I and the team of the Business Model Design Lab keeping? So what you see here is, um, this is a place that I spent like 80% of my time during the past six weeks. And although that <laughs> might look a little sad, it is not as sad as it sounds. So with the Business Model Design Lab, what we do is we meet like twice a day for coffee, more in the morning at 11 and in the afternoon at four. On Fridays, we have after work drinks. Also, we do like yoga, um, usually on Wednesday afternoon, or sometimes we also have like a different special. And in fact, we also celebrated two birthdays of our team members already online. So we try to make the best of it, basically. And now, what I and we prepared for you today is like from, from my side, I would like to talk about three things. Number one, the lab itself, the business model design lab. I want to share like a few trends that we observe at the moment with you. And then I want to close with um, some content and tools that we develop at the Business Model Design Lab. And that might be helpful for you as well. And in fact, we will also have a short demo of uh, Mariana Samento, um, who is um, a fellow at the lab. So maybe let me introduce, um, by, let me start by introducing myself. And for those of you who have already taken a course or workshop with me, of course, this is not uh, entirely new, but for everyone who is new, um, just a few words, as you can hear from my accent, I'm originally from Germany, like the very north, um, Lübeck. And I always studied business. I did my master in, in St. Andrews in Scotland. I did my PhD in Amsterdam. And then in 2015, I was lucky enough to um, be able to join Catholica Lisbon. Um, in between, I also uh, visited MIT as a faculty fellow there. And as a person, my free time, I also like to do uh, music production. In terms of research, my, my focus is very much on business model research, um, specifically digitalization, but also a bit of entrepreneurship. And my focus is on how can digital and sustainable technologies be diffused and uh, adopted faster by the market. Um, next to that, and um, um, Philippe already hinted at, it, at that a little bit, I also do quite a lot of applied work. So that means, um, for instance, I do like a couple of R&D projects in the framework of um, Horizon 2020. Um, I also started the Smart City Innovation Lab. Um, I started several startups myself. And um, I also um, once had the opportunity at Catholica to give a TEDx talk that was um, two years ago and that was really, really exciting actually. So um, at the Business Model Design Lab, our vision very much is um, to develop intuitive content and tools that enable entrepreneurs, not only for startups, but also within corporations and companies to create winning business models. And it is kind of a spin-off, if you will, or a sister lab of the Smart City Innovation Lab, which was already started in 2016. We are six people working there, a postdoc, a PhD, a project manager, uh, one programmer, and also two uh, research fellows. And here you see our fantastic team. Um, you see that here. This is like how we generally show it. Now we show it like this because this is how we see each other uh, more or less every day. And um, together we work on really exciting projects like the platforms that we will show you today, but we work also on projects um, for electricity business models, but also for healthcare business models. And the idea is like, how can we create and capture value in a more sustainable and more successful way? So now let me move from here kind of to share some observations that we see since COVID-19 and what the impact on industries and users are. Um, so 
what we see here is the coronavirus virus impact matrix. And that's something that I've recently seen during a forum. I thought like, this is super interesting and I would like to share that with you today. Um, and what do we see? So basically we have here a matrix with two dimensions. One dimension is cash flow, liquidity, and the other dimension is profitability. And in the middle of this matrix, we have all the different industries mapped and based on their impact, right? And so one of the things that we see that uh, some industries are actually not doing that, um, that badly. So if we think about pharma or medical technologies, even construction and mechanical engineering are not as affected as much by Corona. However, uh, industries that are uh, tremendously impacted are of course retail, airlines, and mostly actually tourism and travel. So the question is, what can firms do about this at this moment? Right? We need to adapt, right? And we need to think about new business models, but it's not only companies that are adapting, and this is like something else that I uh, wanted to share. Uh, also users are adapting. And here um, we see results of a study from McKinsey. And here we see the new digital activities that um, you and me are actually ad adopting. And so if we look at this, we see, for instance, activities such as grocery delivery online before 59% of the people were doing it, that increased just due to um, COVID-19 by 14%. Or if we look at video conferencing for professional use, before Corona, 56 of the people were using um, digital tools and now it's 32% more. Or if you look at this um, further down, remote learning for kids, or also telemedicine for physical health, all of these activities that are online and virtual have increased significantly, right? So, which means that not only companies are affected, but users are affected and they're adopting new activities really, really fast, new digital activities. So, what to do? Okay. And there, um, since I'm also um, teaching strategy at Catholica, um, I thought like, well, there is like also a relatively simple strategy framework. So basically what we, what we always learn as a strategy 101, um, we first analyze the market, we then create options. Based on these options, we decide what kind of like these new activities we could implement in a strategy. And then once we have implemented them, we go into the circle again. So this is kind of like a circle that continues and continues. And in today's time, in, in this today's digital time, of course, the speed on, in which you're doing this has an influence on how successful you are and it has an influence on your competitive advantage. Right? Now, question is, how do you create these kind of options? Um, what, might be, what might be working, what is not working? Um, for, for these kind of questions, we at the Business Model Design Lab have developed content and tools. And the first thing that we would like to share with you is our innovation platform, which is called Venturely. And Venturely is basically a business model innovation platform. Okay? And maybe just to share a few achievements with you. So this is like uh, what was mentioned before. Venturely has won the best ICT tool 2019 award. And back then it was also it, it won that um, under the name of the Smart Business Modeler. So we have recently changed the wording a little bit on this. Um, it is also actually like the first AI-based business modeling tool in the world as we know it. And this is something that we will share with you in a second. And um, the really, really exciting part of that is that this has been developed in the lab, but it has also been developed with uh, master students that have been writing their master thesis at the um, Business Model Design Lab. And some of them I already saw that they are in, in today's call here. Um, foremost, for instance, uh, Michael Astle, who, who did like the first steps. And now we have also Luca and Clemens um, developing new content and new algorithms and new sorts for this tool, which is really, really exciting to work together on this. Um, this is now a platform that is used by more than 3,000 intra and also entrepreneurs 
around the world. And uh, some of the features that you would find there now, as you can do business modeling, education, cash flow planning, and so on. But I think it's much better if, instead of um, I just uh, name those features, if we look at them. And for that, I would like to switch to Mariana, Samento, to do a little demo. And, oops. Thank you, Rene. Can you see my screen? I can. Okay, good. Um, so as Rene was mentioning, this is Ventrally.io. And so when you sign up, you can uh, choose to work on a business idea from ideation to implementation. You can choose to work on your 10 slide pitch deck, or you can just focus on developing a viable and a scalable business model with our business modeling tools. And so today I would like to show you how a company that might not have yet fully embraced a digital business model could do this with Venturely. Um, and so let's, uh, for the purpose of this demo, uh, let's think of a business model of a company similar to Padaria Portuguesa, which we um, sort of can relate to. So like many business leaders, uh, when faced with this empty nine blocks, it can be kind of daunting to now, how can I fill this in? And, and then more after filling them in, uh, how do I now reinvent this? How do I uh, rethink the, the, the configuration of my business model to innovate it towards digitization? So that is when our first tool comes in. This is SmartBot. SmartBot is your dedicated business modeling mentor that will take a step-by-step -step approach to helping you first describe your current business model, then uh, define your strategic focus, and then help you to design a new business model, either towards digitalization or towards sustainability. And so what SmartBot essentially will guide us through is on how to fill in the business model and how to innovate it. And so you can do this two ways, right? So first, uh, thinking about Padaria Portuguesa, Maybe this would be sort of a product kind business model where you create and sell a standardized product being the, the pastries that we all love, right? And so offer daily fresh traditional pastries that are cooked in an artisanal way. And so I can create this post-it and drag and drop it onto the value proposition where I would probably start. And this is one approach. However, this will be very time consuming. And that's when, uh, based on the research at the Business Model Design Lab, we came up with our second business modeling tool, which is the business model database. So essentially, instead of thinking of how to describe your business model from scratch, you can actually leverage a database of about 300 uh, business models that you can quickly drag and drop onto the business model canvas to the appropriate element. And so I'll show you quickly an example, Thinking again about Padaria Portuguesa, maybe in terms of processes. So how will I produce and deliver my product? I think that maybe manufacturing, yes, create and sell assets. Maybe in a way that could fit. And so this would be the process uh, of quickly using the business model database to fill in your business model canvas. And so when I'm done describing, it can maybe look somewhat like this. Um, and here you see that I have decided to focus on the value proposition for the purpose of showing you the next, um, the next business modeling tools. So once I have described my uh, business model in terms of what am I selling, to whom I'm selling it, how will I produce and deliver it, and how will I make a revenue from it, um, I can now start to innovate. And for that, we have two tools to show you. Uh, one of it is the ecosystem radar. And so this is a beta version AI power tool that will uh, essentially look at your uh, business model uh, description and compare it to your ecosystem, uh, to a database of existing companies. And what it will do is it will suggest other companies that have a similar business model to spark creativity and to help you see quickly what others are doing and how maybe you could be inspired by them. So here you would have your closest competitors. So if this does, still does not quite help you, uh, another tool is the auto business modeling tool. So what we did is for the past year and a half, we have been training an algorithm 
with a database of 700,000 companies and their business models that will analyze your current business model and provide you suggestions of other business models that could quick, quickly fit into yours. And so I'm looking to innovate, innovate towards digitalization. For that, I will quickly explore here what is being suggested. Maybe here digitization might fit. And maybe subscription could be interesting to see in the same context. So I select the business model that might fit into my, my current one to innovate, and I apply them. Once they're here, I can quickly describe them. And in a nutshell, very quickly, that is how, or one of the ways in which the Business Model Design Lab is empowering businesses to capitalize on business model innovation with our tools. Thank you. So thank you, Mariana, very much for a very clear presentation. And, and this tool is awesome. I, I'm still very impressed by this. Uh, René, do you want to? Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Just to, just to wrap up. So um, it, it is a fantastic tool. And but for some of you who might not be like too familiar with what is a business model, what does it actually mean, and how does business model innovation come uh, comes about? We have sat together with um, with our team, and we've developed a program for a business development bootcamp. And I just want to point to this. It's not it's not yet uh, advertised, but it will be coming soon. And so what we will do is we will create a two-week bootcamp in which you can learn all the different tools that we have just presented, but like a lot more as well around this. It will be hands-on, it will be online, uh, including the tools that we just presented that will be part of that. And if, if you're interested in that, you can contact uh, Nuno Rolo, you see the email address here, um, or you please also connect to, to myself on LinkedIn um, as Rene Bunzak, but also please follow us as in the Business Model Design Lab um, on LinkedIn in case you have any other questions. Okay. And so with that, now I'm also really, really excited to hand over to, to Rita to learn more about like um, examples that she has been spotted. Hugo, okay. can I just say a few words? Yes, yes, please go ahead. Uh, no, I just wanted to add something. I'm, a, as some of you know, I myself am a, an entrepreneurship faculty member. That was my original PhD and my research for the first 10 years. And I've been teaching about business model innovation for a long time. And I always thought that instead of having two or three or four patterns of business models, one could identify the elements of business models, the different choices that you do in a business model and combine them in different ways and have kind of a kind of a, a generic template tool for developing new business models. And I think what uh, Rene and his team have achieved to do is exactly that through a lot of research and benchmarking uh, and development. They have created this platform that is great for ideation. With this, you have a tool to experiment, to combine uh, in model components different elements and to try to fine tune what could be a business model for the idea that you have. So I really just wanted to compliment being kind of one of an expert in this area. This is wonderful work. So well done to all of the team. I see your energy and, and innovation. So well done to you. Thank you, Flip. Um, uh, I'm passing on to the next speaker. If you want to ask questions uh, to René or Mariana, you can post them in, in chat and then we'll ask them in the end of Rita's Romão presentation. So, as I said, our next speaker is Rita Rumão. So, as Ness Flip said too, that is currently partner at uh, ACA Group, so a strategy and marketing services company, and has dedicated her professional life to the innovation and creation of growth paths uh, to her clients. So, Rita Rumão, the stage is yours. Thank you, Diogo. Thank you to all of you. Um, actually, Diogo, the stage is not mine. I'm at home, like most of you are nowadays. And uh, I'll share with you today the, this my perspective, the ones from the perspective that I get watching the world from the window. And this is really a great analogy because we're all in little windows like uh, Rene presented in, instead of being together. Um, I brought to you today this presentation, which I, I named the uh, Yellow Brick Road, and because I think by now um, we all sense that the world is not going to be the same anymore. So there's a gradual awakening and gradually 
we're becoming aware of the things that are about to change, right? Um, so how do we how do we spot this uh, uh, gradual awakening? What, what's the, what's what's the process behind it? Um, I split it in the presentation into three different parts. Uh, the first part I think is very interesting because it's a wizardry, it's sort of the creation and the surprise process that comes along during these days. The second part is a uh, pure magic. These are the ideas uh, that companies and peoples have put already in place and that they're really performing very well. And, and finally, but of course not the least, uh, is the yellow brick road. It is my personal view into the future. What will this all lead us into? Um, I shall start by saying that I am tremendously optimistic. Just bear with me for a second because I have some... Okay, great. Um, um, minor technological problem to solve here. So I am tremendously optimistic, as I was saying. And why is that? Um, okay, because for the first time, uh, we see the entire world focus in one situation only. There are 7.8 billion people on Earth and they all have one single enemy in common. And specific industries saw the demand drop to zero. Uh, so why is this so interesting when it comes to creating new ideas and to surprise uh, in business? Back in the dictionary, wizard means literally uh, to be clever, uh, to surprise, to find new ways of doing things. And I think that even entrepreneurs sometimes tend to resolve problems with pre-assumptions. So we, it's like we have a, some sort of filter that prevents us from seeing the reality uh, as clear as it should be seen. And now is the time to ask what if question is the time to drop uh, these free assumptions. So for me, wizardry uh, uh, is what companies are performing, it's what they are making and is how they're somehow changing their approach to the market, how they're identifying new customers or how they're really changing their operational model. For the purpose of this analysis, and uh, I have left uh, over uh, some companies that are doing a brilliant job talking to customers during crisis, uh, such is the case of Control. Um, it's uh, this is uh, I brought here today the Instagram page for Friday, and uh, maybe I'll make no comments upon that because today's in uh, we do it in groups is what they say. Uh, we then have time out, which is not time out anymore, it's time in, or we even have the promotion that we call Veran put on, which, is, which means a pickup, which is Veran, where they ask their grandchildren, well, they ask grandchildren to um, state their grandparents' phone number so that they can call the grandparents at home, and if the grandparents are indeed at home, uh, they'll be offered a bottle of liquid. So it's a very clever way of uh, getting emotional con emotionally connected uh, with, the brand, with the consumer, but it's not pure magic. So this is not uh, companies that are already changing their approach to market or already identifying customer needs. For the purpose of the presentation, uh, I've found loads and loads of examples. I was very fortunate. I think we're all very fortunate because uh, uh, there are loads of companies doing different things right now. So I felt the need of grouping them in, two, in three different maturity stages. Uh, the first uh, one I call the, the purity stage for the sake of argument. And uh, these are companies that have been making temporary business adjustments to fight the going crisis. Uh, they're basically directly responding to their urgent, to the urgent health needs. Uh, most likely, these changes will be temporary. So when the crisis is over, they'll go back to the to what they were doing before. Then I saw companies that were going into maturity, and these were those that were struggling to get the client pool back. Uh, or companies that came up with new products or introduced major changes to their distribution channel. 
And I also found the guys that I personally like to call alchemists, uh, which are those that made real changes into their business models with significant impacts in their value change. Let's start, of course, with the first group. And uh, I had to mention Tesla. Tesla is well reputed for its uh, innovation. Uh, some even argue that Tesla is not a car manufacturer, but a manufacturer of computer, of computer uh, rig wheels. And here we have Tesla innovating again because it has uh, made new contributions to its portfolio by making ventilators from composed part of electric cars. Uh, they, this includes the, the using of infotainment system, the use of air and oxygen mixing chamber, and several sensors that are also used in Tesla vehicles. Uh, a lot of other companies are doing uh, this approach. Ford is getting creative about manufacturing tool by using airbag materials to produce reusable gowns. Um, Louis Vuitton, Burberry, Chanel started to produce masks. Uh, so they're looking after the most needed. Again, they're trying to engage with the, the, the consumers on a different basis. And we also have come going on to a different stage now. Uh, so remember that uh, this is the companies that are getting a little more, bit more mature in this uh, in this process. I have chosen to start with Hidrofer. Uh, Hidrofer is a Portuguese-based company that operates in the cotton wool sector. And I don't to explain this. I have to go a little bit back. Uh, some of you might not be might, might not be familiar with the word swabs. Uh, I wasn't myself either. Uh, swabs is a particular gadget that uh, enables the collection of human specimens, and this is very important nowadays because it's it's the gadget that allows the realization of COVID tests uh, tests to the population. So Hydrofer rapidly adapted its uh, cotton wool production to, pre to start to produce swab, swabs, swabs, not quite sure how you spell that out. Um, and they're currently producing 50,000 swabs per hour. Portugal consumes 12,000 swabs per hour. This is particularly interesting because our country has gone from importer of swabs to a worldwide leader of exporter in one of the most wanted medical items at the moment. Um, another example that was briefly mentioned by Renee, thank you for that Renee, uh, we all witness um, the industry fitness going virtual. There are live streaming classes, uh, there are yoga classes, there's meditation online, uh, but some clubs are making it even it more radical approach. They developed like the ones here, uh, good set. Uh, they have developed personalized platforms to engage with their customers where they can track my real performance and they can even check how many calories I'm taking at the current moment. Um, in the US, some clubs are renting their own spinning bikes during the shutdown period. So they're using, really using its capability to full maximum. Uh, magic also happens uh, with the video streaming industry. Netflix party, to mention just some of the brands that are now doing it. Uh, but Netflix party, as I said, is a browser extension that syncs streams so that friends and families can watch films together. Uh, they even added a little chat on the side so that we can comment upon what we are seeing in real time. And uh, it's a particular trend to follow to make this industry even uh, bigger. Netflix, by the way, is one of the companies that's performing better uh, in the uh, New York Stock Exchange at the moment. Uh, but other, other companies have came up with interesting solutions as well. There's an initiative called Secret Sofa, and it's a partnership between haagen and Amazon Prime, where haagen uh, delivers ice creams to all of those that watch uh, Video Prime series or consume Video Prime 
um, Amazon Prime, sorry, uh, products. And, uh, reinventing the hospitality experience uh, is also a trend coming along. HSH um, was created uh, with restaurants and local partners and it allows a consumer to enjoy a holiday-like experience but in the comfort of its own home. HSH is a, um, a, an Amsterdam-based company. They do virtual check-ins, they do, they could curated locally sourced welcome kits, they do online entertainment and they even set up a concierge available if you need to get something out from the street. Um, the famous luxury um, hotel chain Camp in Helsinki is also offering 24-hour room service takeaway or home delivery. I think I wrote this example here because I think uh, tourism accounts for uh, because tourism accounts, of course, for 20% of uh, uh, the world GDP, and uh, it's one of the most tourism affected industries. So, uh, this is sort of a glimpse of good energy coming into uh, these industries. Um, next, Clean is a very interesting example about the importance of being fast and of being first in the market. Next, Clean didn't exist uh, two months ago, and just to uh, Within two months, they have a new brand, a new product, which is a hand sanitizer that is non-toxic, gentle, uh, and more effective, they claim, than bleach or al alcohol. Um, uh, also, from this uh, maturity stage, we have a, a virus-killing robot. Um, this is very important, as you may guess, because spaces, particularly in the hospitality, uh, the hospitality industry, and most hospitals as well, uh, spaces are very susceptible, susceptible. Sorry about that to a virus. Um, so these robots are disinfecting rooms, and they're communicating with quarantine and delivering. Uh, essential business, essential goods to hotels, rooms, whenever needed. Uh, this trend of technology living among us is something that we're going to watch for um, in the near future. Uh, another Portuguese example, which has also been um, copied by uh, Netherlands companies, which is doing pretty much the same thing, is Joulard. Uh, uh, René also mentioned in his presentation his current office. He was sitting at a table, perhaps at home, and Jula came up with a pop-up office where people can actually have its own office uh, in its home. So they've gone from modular houses to modular offices. This trend of, um, uh, of companies to reduce Juice office spaces, it's very interesting because it will bring along different suppliers. People will now require special equipment, they'll need machines, they'll need printers, they'll need advanced audio uh, setups. Uh, we will also have to think in different work policies, new insurances will follow and uh, everything that has to do with the work environment pretty much will change. Uh, uh, a quick note um, that I found and I want to share with you that has to do with online dating. Quite a surprise here. Um, so Love is Quarantine is a dating app that was created uh, after a, a series from Netflix named Love is Blind. And what they do is they impose quarantine times into their into their members and they're more, fo they're more focused to create uh, virtual datings than actual datings themselves. So everybody's pretty much looking on how to innovate here. Um, now going back, heading on to, I mean, the very last, uh, the very last group of companies. We have an excellent example of a Portuguese company again, Zoom, uh, which is already doing virtual applications to showcase its uh, properties uh, online. Um, 
uh, virtual property showcases is uh, particularly relevant in uh, real estate industries. It means clients can see a lot of houses, but will also reduce in-house visits because, of course, we can do first screenings virtually. We don't have to go into people's houses anymore. Uh, in some cases, immersive realities can be created. Uh, virtual staging can also happen. By this, I mean we will be able to see the place we're about to buy with our own furniture. We will also be able to recreate the apartment with the refurbishment and cozy spaces that we want to create in it. So there's a, a whole new world of possibilities uh, coming up here. Zoom uh, has gone even two steps further, I dare to say, because they've introduced virtual interactions with clients that go beyond the simple chat box online. And they, re they read now clients' intentions through its navigation pattern. Um, and they also introduced a buying and selling platform to perform contracting online and enable, of course, the social distance required nowadays. Patricia Sant recently said at the local newspaper they have already visible results by implying these measures. Um, governments are also acting as entrepreneurs. Several governments have now deployed new surveillance chair reference tools. Uh, this one is called Trace Together, Safer Together, is from Singapore. Uh, it's an interesting example because they not just created, but they made it open source so, they, so that it could be available to lots of people and uh, all other governments to share. And uh, uh, through Bluetooth signals or through georeference, uh, governments can now to have full traceability of their citizens, they can inform them where to go, where not to go, depending on the infection focus. Uh, they can they can tell whether someone has been in um, in an infection area and within certain periods, and they can actually redirect people according to that. Um, by April 17. 40% of Icelandic population have downloaded, 80% of Singaporean people have downloaded as well, and 70% of Israeli people also have downloaded. Um, uh, just out of curiosity, these are the countries that are doing better in terms of um, fighting, the, fighting the focus of infection, so it's a very interesting uh, app to have. Um, virtual experiencing medical care. Um, uh, this example, MedicSpot, comes from the UK. They now have 50 kiosks totally available uh, in pharmacies and these kiosks come complete with medical with all the medical equipment needed for examination. So this is not a, a, screen, a screen where I can talk to my patient. Uh, it includes a blood pressure cuff, stethoscope, pulse oximeter, thermometer, and a camera to see into throats and ears. Um, it's really a borderline example because a lot of people will come along and say, uh, the, med the medicine act, uh, act and the relationship with the patient might get jeopardized, uh, but it's a trend and we'll have to see how it will evolve in the near future. Uh, pretty much all these examples that I've looked into have uh, one thing in common and this is the new relationship uh, with space. Um, as I was researching, a lot of people, uh, a lot of articles that have been uh, written at this point, they talk about a contact-free economy or low-touch economy. And this is something that we're going to see over and over and really has to do with this space relationship. Let me try to uh, go a little bit further on this. Imagine a world where a manufacturing plant has 100% of tasks automated, so no people, 
everything is performed by computers or robot computers as, as we've seen earlier. A world where money transactions are all performed electronic, a world with online classes, yoga classes, a world where everything is delivered directly from the computer to the door. Uh, in this world, human contact will be minimized, but relations will most certainly prevail. So in this world, the cleavage that we now have between virtual reality, immersive reality, digital reality will no longer exist. They are all just reality. So uh, the pandemics is somehow um, forcing us to redefine this relationship and to incorporate all these new technology wonders uh, into our offers and into our way of working. So, uh, heading on to the end, I hope I'm not uh, taking too long. Um, what is really, after looking through all these examples, what does this road looks like, uh, look like? What is the path that we have to follow? How, to, how do we access into the future? Um, and who will succeed into the future is also a very interesting question. Let me tell you a few tips. Um, I don't know who will succeed in the future for sure. Uh, uh, one thing that we have witnessed is that the speed of change of and the flow of information is constant. So an interesting uh, tip is to look at the stock exchange, see what companies are performing better uh, and see what's the rate uh, uh, um, that how that these companies are performing. That's a good thing. So if you, uh, in a month's time, um, we look at the stock exchange uh, uh, or downtown, for, for instance, we will certainly uh, watch difference. Uh, nowadays, um, Netflix is doing great. So we Zoom, pretty much uh, all uh, Amazon Prize and, and Amazon and retail online industry is doing good. Let's see what we'll have in uh, in a month or two time, times. But um, we will also have to look at not just who will succeed, but how will companies succeed. And um, uh, at this point, I'll share my insights after looking um, at the reality. I believe that uh, we're going to witness a true power of, from shared sharing emotions. Um, I'm going to quote Tihani Muhammad Ban in a recent speech that he made to the United Nations. He says, solidarity proved to be our best and first line of defense. We are witnessing incredible levels of citizen mobilization and acts of solidarity across the world. Hundreds of local WhatsApp of mutual aid networks have been created. Uh, digital mobilization is incredible. We have short demos of products. We have servers available online. We have um, online education free of charge from uh, the very top faculties of the world. Laboratories are sharing information, something never seen, uh, in order to join forces uh, onto finding a cure or uh, to find a vaccine for corona. Uh, volunteering, uh, volunteers are looking for elderly and vulnerable neighborhoods. So uh, it's everywhere across Europe. People are even singing to one another to keep spirits up. Um, the social distancing and self-isolation they're relieving hasn't prevented us from connecting to one another. Uh, and this is really interesting because it will lead directly to my very point, uh, my very last uh, remark of this presentation, is that we will definitely be reconnecting uh, with Earth. The effects of the downturn that we are witnessing have a massive transformation on Earth. Venice waters are cleaner, the air pollution has fallen to unprecedented levels, lockdowns have changed the earth moves. I don't think even Greta would have dreamed of such a thing. So this age of indiv individualism has come 
to an end, in my point of view. Um, I think COVID-19, and this is the reason why I'm particularly uh, optimistic about uh, this whole chaotic situation, because I think COVID-19, as I was saying, is the perfect calibrated wake-up call. It's not enough deadly. Uh, to create loads of that, uh, but it's forcing us to look to the world uh, with different eyes because it's forcing us to stop. Uh, it's forcing us to join relations, it, to mobilize to a common ground. So we nowadays, we are definitely more prepared to face a global crisis that might come along than we were before COVID. And of course, if you want to know my opinion, uh, the next global challenge that we're going to face is climate change. By 2013, there will be 1.8 billion people, 19 or younger. These individuals have little or no experience of a world before COVID-19. And this generation will most certainly bring different assumptions into uh, the decision-making process. Uh, this will mean that um, we will all have to uh, come up with creative, create creative solutions to our problems. Uh, this means that we now all have time to learn by doing learn with the COVID process, we now all have time to focus on the planet, we now all have time to rejoin with uh, our own essence. Thank you.